Live Well, Energy Saving and Build Management by H. Irwin, the Yorkshire Energy Doctor, on the 14th of July 2022. About Live Well. Live Well is a series of events aimed at helping people make the most of life with sight loss. Live Well is a collaborative project between six local independent sight societies. Sight Advice South Lakes, Humbria, My Sight's Not, Nottingham, Sight Airedale in the Airedale area of North and West Yorkshire, Support for Sight in Mid and West Essex, Sutton Vision in the London Borough of Sutton, and Outlookers in Huddersfield in West Yorkshire. Good morning everybody. Um, this is the, the, the Rainbow Group, which as everybody knows is a, a collaboration of six sight loss organisations. Um, and every two weeks we have a, a show of some type, whether technology or living well. This is a living well one, you'd like to know. And we've got Kate Irwin, who's the Yorkshire Energy Doctor. Now she's going to give us some tips on how to, I don't know, improve your efficiency of your energy and maybe some money saving tips to the whole Yorkshire Martin Lewis thing. Okay, so um, we are recording folks. Um, so over to you, Kate. And, and also, Kate, it's quite happy for people to, you know, um, bring up issues during her talk. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. And thanks for inviting me along. Um, good to see you all today. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I run an organisation called Yorkshire Energy Doctor. We're based um, sort of between York and Selby, basically, in North Yorkshire. And we're a bit like the Citizens Advice um, or someone like Martin Lewis, but we just give advice on energy bills um, so it's obviously been quite a, yeah, a difficult time at the moment. Um, certainly don't think since I started doing this about eight years ago that energy would just be in the news quite as much as it has been over the last sort of six to eight months. Um, so what I was going to do today is just kind of run through some of the sort of facts and figures behind some of the headlines that have been in the news around energy. Um, just give you a bit of information about what's been happening, what's going to happen later this year, tell you a bit about some of the sort of financial help that the government's giving, give you a bit of information and tips on what you can do in your own homes to save energy. We generally just have a bit of a chat about anything to do with energy. Um, so I hope that sounds OK. Um, so I will sort of share my screen and show you um, some slides, but I will sort of talk through all of them, but it sort of helps me keep on track as well if I can just go through the slides but as Tim said I don't really like well he didn't say this but I'll say this for him I don't really like listening to my own voice for like an hour um, so if you have got questions or just want to sort of follow up on anything then yeah happy to stop and do that as well so I will start sort of sharing my screen then now um, so, and I will sort of email these slides to Tim afterwards so he can circulate them for anybody who wants any, you know, just for reference. Um, so, as I say, we're going to sort of talk through some of the headlines um, that has been going on recently. And what I'm going to start with, which might be a bit depressing, so apologies about that, is a headline from the BBC News website just last week, um, where it says that household energy bills are going to hit £3,000 per year. Um, and this is going to be from October. So what we have around energy bills in this country is like a price cap and it sets the maximum amount that energy companies can charge their customers. Um, it changes every six months. So we last had a price rise on the 1st of April. So some of you might have got a letter on the 1st of April to say, you know, these are your new prices and the next one's going to come in in October. So there is going to be quite a big rise again, um, which is a bit of a nightmare, not going to lie. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a few tips on what you can do around sort of managing your own energy bills. And I th think the first one on my list is just to be aware of the price rises. So, you know, you should get a letter probably in sort of September time to say, right, these are your new prices from October and if you start getting really high bills, it's, it's not going to be the case that the energy company is suddenly charging you for a shed load of energy. It is just that the prices have gone up so much. 
Um, and in terms of the actual sort of price cap, it's not, your bill could still be higher than that. It kind of caps like the unit prices. So, you know, like if, if you go to the petrol station and you, you know, see, right, your price of diesel, we're going to cap that at £1.50, um, which obviously isn't going to happen at the moment. Um, but how much you actually spend on your diesel depends on how much you drive. So it's same for energy. If you use more, your bill will still be higher than the energy price cap. So be aware of what's happening with that. Um, if any of you are lucky enough to be on a fixed deal for your energy, so if you signed up to a fixed price contract, say, a year ago, then just don't do anything. Um, just see it out for as long as possible because that will be cheaper than anything else you can get. And if you're somebody who perhaps was on a fix and that's come to an end, um, then you will have seen your prices go up. You might be wondering whether it's worth signing up for another fixed deal, but you will find that those prices are so much more expensive at the moment than just the sort of variable rates. So it's, it's a really difficult one to actually access, um, you know, cheaper energy prices at the moment. So on number four on my list, this just talks about whether you should go on a fix or not. Um, I sort of go with what Martin Lewis says, and if, if you can find a tariff that's no more than 55% higher than your current rate, it may be worth doing. But I think in summary, talk, find out from your existing company what they can offer you. Um, but I think for most people, it's gonna be a case of just stick with what you've got. And number five on my list around sort of advice around your energy bills, it's just being aware that switching energy company doesn't really make much difference at the moment. And if I'd come to speak to you about a year ago, we would have been banging on about shop around, don't stick with your energy company, find a cheaper deal. But it's just not particularly relevant at the moment, unfortunately. Um, number six on the list is do sort of review your direct debit payments if you do pay direct debit. Um, energy companies have been investigated recently for hiking up people's payments a lot when they didn't actually need to. So after the April price rise, a lot of people saw their direct debits doubling, um, but the prices didn't double, they went up 50%. So if you did find, or you are finding that your energy company is really whacking up your direct debit payments, then you can question that with them. And they do have to give you some information on why and how they've calculated that. So it's definitely worth just sort of looking into particularly if you're someone who's in credit on their account. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. Same thing, um, number seven is, you know, we don't want people to be paying more than they need to, but we do want you to be paying enough because it's always better to pay a little bit more perhaps than to get behind. So make sure you're paying enough to cover the increased prices. Um, I don't know if any of you top up on a prepayment meter. So if any of you go to the shop um, to put money onto a key or card or top up on a phone. Um, but if you do have a prepayment meter, then my next tip is, can you put extra money on it over the sort of summer ready for the winter? Um, because being on prepayment can be quite a challenge in winter because you've obviously got to find all that money in one go, particularly for your heating. Uh, number nine on my list is if you pay when the bill comes or if you pay a standing order, it's really worth thinking about switching to pay direct debit because there is a difference in energy prices depending on how you pay. So as I say, if you get the bill every month or get the bill every three months and just go and pay it, you could save at the moment about £130 a year by switching to direct debit. But come October, it could save you about £200 a year. So just think, and to be honest, paying direct debit is easier. Um, so that could be another way to look at sort of saving a bit of money. And then finally on my list is try to give regular meter readings to your energy company. Um, and, you know, if you haven't got a smart meter, you could get a smart meter and I'll come on to that later. And that will send you meter readings for you. Um, but giving those regular meter readings can just help 
understand exactly how much your bills are, make sure they're not estimated, make sure you're not going to get some massive shock bill in six months time and just keep an eye on things. I think with energy, we're all guilty, to be honest, of just going, oh, yeah, they just take my payment every month. I have no idea what my bills are. Um, but just, yeah, keep an eye on things. And because it is, uh, I hate that word because it's used all the time, but it is sort of unprecedented at the moment um, in terms of those price rises. So those are the sort of 10 tips that I'd have on sort of managing your energy bills. I don't know if anyone's got any questions sort of about their own bills or anything they've come across or anything they want to just comment on. Point, point eight, uh, Tim here, point eight. Okay. Yeah. The prepayment meter, let's say you put money in, £100 in, say, in July extra on top. Yeah. Um, okay. And the, uh, But the price of electricity went up, say, in, you know, in September. That £100, are you buying electricity uh, on the cheaper rate? Yeah, does that, like, carry over on a prepayment meter? How does that work? Or, or maybe it doesn't at all. Yeah, it's a really good question because before the prices went up on the 1st of April, Martin Lewis had been telling people to basically put as much money on their meter as they could in advance because then quite often the meter doesn't update the prices until you top up. So if you put money on in advance, which then lasts you the whole of the next month after the price rises, then you get it at that sort of cheaper rate. But I don't know if that is actually going to be the case and sometimes they go back and look at you know exactly if they sort of estimate what your reading would have been and sort of even though you're on prepayment they do still send out sort of bills every year and they they might do some sort of working out of the figures um, if you've got a smart prepayment meter the prices get updated automatically so that wouldn't matter in terms of stacking it up with money um, but yeah, so it may well depend on what company you're with in terms of whether that works or not. Um, but certainly putting the money on it will help because you're not having to find it all in the winter in one go. So, OK, it's more about spreading the cost. Yeah. As as getting it cheaper then. But yeah. a smart meter, you won't get it cheaper anyway. No, but, but no. There's a, there's a small chance you might get it cheaper if you've got one of those payment sticks you take to the possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Only a possibility, though. Okay, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions on anything around your energy bills? Um, regarding direct debit? Yeah. Um, I've got one with an oil company and, and they put it, they doubled it. And I went overdrawn only by a small amount and I was able to move some money. But um, just to warn people that they can put it up double if you've not budgeted for that amount. Yeah, it's a really good point on oil um, because the oil prices aren't capped. Like, you know, if people are on mains gas, their gas prices will be capped every six months. But oil, you're just at the sort of bakeries, really, aren't you, of the market? And I know that a tip, sort of minimum order of oil will be double what it is at the moment than it was sort of this time last year. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. And you'd think that they should give you notice that they're going to do that for your direct debit and not just take it um but yeah it's a really good point and really good tip <laughs> to keep an eye on that and, and and also on the direct debit we've actually contacted our electric company because they were going to increase it and we were in the credit right so we've advised them that, that we don't want it we, we'll let it go up a small amount but as we're in credit there's no need for them to increase it yeah, absolutely. And this is what a lot of them have been doing. Um, and I think it was just yesterday, actually, that there was a report came out. Some energy companies, they off gem found, oh, no, you've been OK. But others did find that they had been putting them up unnecessarily. So, yeah, it's always worth sort of speaking to the company and finding out why. Whereas on the other hand, you obviously want to be paying enough, but you don't want to be overpaying. Um, so, yeah. So thank you for that, for sharing. Thank you, Kate. Thanks. Is there anybody else who wants to say anything? Hello, it's Anthony from Site Airdale. Just a question about the fixed rates. Yeah. Is it worth signing up for a two year fixed rate or, you know, 
are we just going to be locking ourselves into expensive, you know, an expensive tariff for two years, or is it is it uh, is it worth just staying on? At a moment, we've got a variable rate. Uh, is it just worth staying on that? I do you know what? It's such a good question. It's such a difficult question to answer um, just because we don't really know what's going to happen over that sort of longer term, particularly over two years. Um, I mean, I know. And also, as you say, you'll be locking yourself in, but also some of these fixed ones have massive exit fees. I think some of them, you know, if you decided you wanted to leave before the end of the two years, some of them have exit fees of like hundred pounds or something. So um, it's, I mean, I had a look earlier this week when I was doing a course and any fixed tariff at the moment, if you went to a comparison website, uh, about sort of 15, 1800 pounds more expensive than the variable rates. And I would think that, and I just don't know because I don't have a crystal ball, but I would doubt that the variable rates would go up that much. Um, but I mean, this is why partly I always go on what sort of Martin Lewis recommends because he's got a team of people who do all the number crunching, sort of looking at what, you know, might happen at the next price cap and the next price cap. And he's come up with this 55% figure. So if, for example, the prices are going to go up to, well, if you're on the variable rate at the moment, the average is about £2,000 a year. So if you could find a, fixed rate that's perhaps no more than say 3,000, 3,200 pounds a year, that might be worth doing. Um, but if you're getting up towards sort of 4,000 pounds, I would suggest it possibly not, but it's a really difficult one, to be honest. <laughs> um, can I just ask a quick question from the phone? Um, yeah, yeah of course. If you can hear me. Yeah, yeah I can hear you, um, yeah. I just, I just had a quick question. You mentioned about the, um, like the unit you know, the analogy was like with petrol in your car, you know, like, um, you know, they're charging you how much per litre or, or yeah. whatever. But the question was like, um, is that price, is that what changes like when they, some people say, you know, use electricity, do your do your dishwasher, you know, at night or your washing machine and stuff like that. Does that mean during those times, I guess gas is always the same or, you know, does gas and electricity, do they, do they, do they change the you know price per litre at different hours, and is that significant enough to actually is it worth actually changing your lifestyle? Yeah. So how it works. So yeah, you're exactly right. So the unit price. So just as an example, at the moment, an electric unit price is about twenty p a kilowatt, and a gas unit price is about seven p a kilowatt. So it's those prices that are fixed during the price cap period. Now. Whether it's cheaper to do your washing at night depends on whether you're on an economy seven electricity tariff. So if you look at your bill or when you give meter readings, if you give two different readings, it means that you have an economy seven meter. So they record how much you use during the day and how much you use for the seven hours overnight, which is usually between about midnight and seven in the morning. If you only have got one electric reading, or when you look at your bill, you're just being charged the same amount for all of your electric. It won't make any difference if you do anything overnight. So most people who have economy seven tariffs tend to have night storage heaters um, and are heated by electric because the storage heaters heat up overnight when it's cheaper and then release the heat during the day. Um, if you've got gas central heating or oil central heating, you're going to be using most of your electric during the day and you should probably just be on a flat rate electric. Um, so it really completely depends what type of electric meter you have and whether you're on an economy seven tariff. Hey, thanks, yeah, so I think at the moment we're probably, because we use gas central heating, we're probably um, pointlessly uh, <laughs> leaving our washing till the evening where it doesn't, I'll have a look at the bill, but it, we might not have a slip bill, so it might be just doing it for no reason. Yeah, have a look, definitely yeah. look at your bill yeah. and see, see if it's just, or being charged at the same rate or not. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Can I ask you a question about Economy 7? What, what's the difference in price between a, an Economy 7 unit used overnight and one that's used in the day? Because the daytime ones are more expensive than the, the average daytime tariffs for non-Economy 7 customers, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. So at the moment, um, it used, I think at the moment you'd probably be looking at um, 
about 20, let me just tell you actually, just bear with me a second. Um, I can just find it. Because uh, I got asked this the other day, but I think you'll be looking at about 20. It used to be, you used to be able to get an economy seven tariff for about um, sort of 5p, 7p, something like that overnight. Um, but now, if your day rate is around probably around 28p, your night rate is probably about 20p. Um, so it's that that sort of difference. Um, I think I might have just said that the day usually electric's around 20 pence. It's not, it's about 28 pence on average at the moment for electric. So if you're an economy seven tariff, you'll probably be paying possibly say early 30s for your day and probably about 20 pence overnight. So it's it's just the nighttime rate has gone up so much more. Um, in recently. So the nighttime rate now is probably what we were paying on our electric a little while ago. So it's, yeah. Um, so it's it's not, not a huge benefit of ever doing economy seven. No, they, they usually say you have to be using at least sort of 30% of your, 35% of your electric at night to make it worth being on an economy seven tariff. Right. Um, so that's yeah you could sort of perhaps do a calculation but because the economy seven is either between say midnight and seven in the morning or between half midnight and 7 30 in the morning it's it's not like it's in the evening which makes it easier to do stuff it is sort of in the middle of the night um, when it's yeah. cheap uh, right kate uh, i'm going to have to shoot off now alan so thanks for your help so um okay so that's sort of around your energy bills and I just wanted to just let you know on my next slide what some of the financial help is that the government's giving um, just because the prices are going up so much. So in the winter, everybody is going to get £400 towards their energy bills. And this will get paid onto your electricity account. This isn't means tested. It's for every household in the country who pays electric bills. So you'll get £400 payment as I say, direct to your energy company. They'll start be being, payments will start being made from October onwards, but I don't know if there's an absolute deadline for it. I'm assuming it could be any time over the winter. So you don't need to do anything for that. You don't need to apply for it. You'll just get that 400 pounds. Now, if any of you get any means tested benefits, so either things like universal credit um, or pension credit guarantee or anything like that, you're going to get, an extra 650 pounds. So this is gonna be paid in two lump sums. So half of it, so I'm about 325 pounds is gonna be paid in the next couple of weeks. So they've said it will be after the 14th of July, which is today. So you'll start, if that applies to anybody, that you'll get that 325 pounds at some point in the next couple of weeks. And that will be paid direct into the bank account where you get your means tested benefit. So again, you don't have to apply for it. It will just come automatically. And then the other half of it will come in the autumn at some point. So although this is designed to help with energy bills, it's not being paid by the energy company. Um, so it's up to you really, whether you want to pay that onto your energy account. Um, for some of you, um, like the person who spoke earlier, who've got oil, you know, obviously that's going to help people who aren't just on mains gas, which is why one of the reasons it's going into bank accounts. So it's really up to you what you do with that money. Um, but it is coming, as I say, the first payment in the next couple of weeks. The I third element of help is for anybody who receives non means tested disability benefits. So that could be PIP or attendance allowance or DLA, anything like that. Um, you'll get £150 Again, that will be paid into your bank account and that will be around September time. So again, it's it's not specifically going to your energy bill. It's up to you what you do with that money. Um, and then the final one is for anybody who gets the winter fuel allowance. So this will be for anybody who's a pensioner. Um, you're going to get an extra £300 as a top up to that winter fuel allowance. And again, it will go into a bank account wherever you get your winter fuel allowance. So that is 300 pounds 
per household. Um, and it's, as I say, it's, it's, it's not going to be means tested because winter fuel allowance isn't means tested. Um, but that will be around November, December time. So these are, aren't like mutually exclusive. You can qualify for more than one of them. So potentially, if you're a pensioner who gets pension credit guarantee and attendance allowance, you will get all four of those payments. Um, so that's just to make you aware of, of what's coming um, in terms of help with energy bills. Now, the government did put this package together based on average energy bills going up to £2,800 a year. We now think they're going to be well over to £3,000 a year. So whether any more help will come, I don't know. But that is what's coming um, in the next sort of few months up until Christmas. Does anyone have any questions on any of that? Um, just, just it was incidental. It's not really an important thing. But um, the actual split for that six fifty is three twenty six and three twenty four. I don't know okay. why. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I just have a quick question from the phone again? Sorry. Yeah. Um, just briefly, like if if you think you're waiting for like um, uh, the, the four hundred pound one or whatever, and it, it doesn't arrive, what do you do? Do you contact the government or? Well, it will be paid, so it will be sort of administered by your energy company. Um, I think the difficulty is because at the moment they haven't said exactly when to expect it by. Um, so I think it will be a case of waiting to see when they expect to make the payments because they have said it could be any time sort of from October onwards, and which means it could potentially be any time over the winter, I'm guessing. So I think, it, yeah, we need to try and find out when the deadline is. And if you haven't had it by then, I think it would probably be a case of speaking to your energy company. And you would find that deadline from from like the news or from like your local energy, your energy supplier? Yeah, I mean, I think in the government guidance they've released, released on this, it's been quite vague, kind of in the sense of being paid sort of staggered across October to even March, it might be. So it is quite vague. Um, but whether they'll release more detailed guidance on it, but I would I would think any of uh, probably on one the government website I would think would be the best place to go um, find the exact guidance Thanks. on it. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, Tim here again. Just two two quick questions. Um, can you give me those figures again for what the government estimate was for the bill, you know, the 2001, and now the new estimates? What are those two figures again, please? Yeah, so it was a few months ago when Ofgem said that they expected the price cap to rise to £2,800. Yeah. Um, and this is what this is all based on. The figures last week suggested it could be about 3000 to be specific, £3,240 from October. Um, yeah. But how it's worked out, we have like a six month assessment period, which um, the end of which is the end of July. So during that six month assessment period, they look at what happens to like the wholesale price of gas. Um, and so we've obviously still got two more weeks until the end of July. So after the end of July, we'll know for sure what's going to happen because they'll have all the figures to do the calculations on. Um, but it's why it sort of changes over the months because you know when Ofgem announced it we could well have been sort of only three months into the assessment period so it's very uncertain what would happen after that. And wasn't there a move to make the assessment period shorter to three months and possibly might be one in January as well? As yeah that they are going ahead with that so the 3,240 if it's something around that will be come in on the 1st of October for three months then absolutely they're shortening it so the next one in January will start on the 1st of January um, the reason they said they were going to do that is so energy companies could pass on reductions in costs to their customers quicker. Um, but I sort of feel it means that they can also pass on increases in costs quicker. And from what I've read, they expect the one in January to potentially go up another hundred pounds um, from what it will be in October. So not a mass, not as big an increase, but still another little increase. Um, but again, it will just depend what happens over that sort of next assessment period. This obviously is, you know, pretty critical for everybody at the moment. And there's, you know, it's, it's unsustainable, like going forward from these prices over the next year, the year after that. I mean, 
what, what is it that's going to bring these prices back down to a more realistic level? Well, I mean, I think sort of recently the, the war in Ukraine certainly hasn't been helping and that's what's pushed up the prices sort of more recently. Um, but I mean, I think we need to get more sustainable. We need to be sort of generating our own energy so we're not relying on so much on, you know, the sort of worldwide situation and global prices. Um, but that's not going to be a quick fix. But absolutely, it's not sustainable. The prices in this winter is are just not going to be affordable for lots of households. Um, and it's really worrying. And I think there needs to be more support coming for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you think back, if if you used to shop around sort of a year and a half, two years ago, you'd get your cheapest deal on average about £800 a year. And now we're talking about over £3,000. So it's it's just not sustainable. Um, and, you know, if you think perhaps households are on the most basic, say, universal credit or something like that, you're not getting much more than £4,000 a year. So it's, it's just not it's just not sustainable. So I don't know whether they'll ever come down to, you know, what they used to be a few years ago. Um, hey. I, 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 it, it's Mark. I'm just, just sort of broadening it ever, ever so slightly. I mean, it, this might be a bit beyond the scope of what you do, but I just wonder whether you actually ever hear anything about any sort of support coming for, uh, for, for charities, for example, because, you know, as, as some people may or may not know, uh, charities and like businesses are, are not able to benefit from something like the energy cap. So I just would, on, in your work, I just wonder whether you ever picked anything up or if it's something you could discuss afterwards, perhaps. Yeah, no, I'm not aware of anything, but it's, no. you know, it's sort of charities, it's small businesses. Yeah. You know, I mean, I dread to think how much, you know, you're probably paying on sort of non-domestic rates. Um, but no, they, it just doesn't seem to be considered almost. Um, but, you know, it's going to put, I don't think it's too harsh to say it will put some charities and small businesses out of business because of the cost of energy. Um, but no, the, the price cap doesn't apply. And I, I haven't heard anything that, for any support for that sort of thing. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Okay. So, so that's those some oh. sort of financial support. We'll wait and see whether anything else comes, comes out. Um, so the next thing I just wanted to mention quickly, the next headline I've got up on my screen is a, it just says together energy becomes 26th uh, supplier to go bust in energy price crisis, hitting 176,000 more customers. So this was from a few months ago, earlier this year, um, because there's been a massive loss of energy companies since last sort of September. Um, and the reason, because the prices went up so much, we had the price cap on the 1st of October, Energy companies couldn't pass those price rises on to their customers. So we just lost loads and loads of companies. So at the moment, there's probably now about 25 different energy companies you can choose from. Um, at the peak in 2018, there used to be about 70. Um, so there has been a lot of loss of companies. Um, wow. It may well have happened to some of you guys. If it, We had lost another couple um, a few days ago, just some of the smaller ones. Um, but I think the main thing just to say is if it does happen to you, just don't panic. You won't get cut off. You'll just be transferred over to another company who will sort it all out for you. Um, it is a bit of a pain, but, you know, it is what it is. But one of the big issues is that we all pay the cost of these companies going bust. So, for example, the energy company Bulb, um, they're the biggest company that's gone bust. They had about 1.7 million customers and they were just so big, they couldn't transfer all those customers to a new company. So it's still traded, trading under the name Bulb, um, but it's in administration. But I saw a report this week that said we're all paying £164 on our energy bill to cover the cost of Bulb going bust. And you just think, plus there'll be another contribution to all the other companies that have gone bust. So it's just, it, you may be with a company that hasn't gone under, but we are all paying for it. And part of the price rise is particularly in the standing charge that you might have noticed is covering the cost of these companies that have gone under. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I mean, the standard charge, 
has gone up considerably, hasn't it? The daily, you know, standing charge. It used to be oh, my company. Well, I'm, I'm with Bulb actually. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it, I mean, it was like 19, 19p or something, and now it's 40p. Yeah, the, the standing charge on the electric, particularly, has gone up very significantly. Um, you'd be looking at probably about nearly £160 a year just on the standing charge for electric. So before you've even used anything, um, you know, you're paying that that amount. So, yeah, it is, it is a bit of a nightmare. They are looking at that. There's been suggestions that they shouldn't put so many of these costs into the standing charge. Um, but, yeah, it's certainly, yeah, you're right. The electric standing charge has gone up significantly. Is the, is the standing charge subject to the energy app or can they put the standing charge up to anything you like? Yeah, so the standing charge is part of the energy cap. So when they fix the, the unit prices and the standing charges, they have to kind of take them both into account. So if they say, right, the price cap for an average household is set at £2,000, they work out what they would need to set the unit price at and the standing charge at to make sure it comes in at that amount. Um, so the standing charge would be fixed for those six months, the same as the unit cost, but then it yeah could go up again um, next time the price cap's reviewed. I think they need to introduce a fairer pricing mechanism because, you know, for people who are on very low incomes that can't afford anything, it would be good to have like a you know, everybody was entitled to have so many kilowatt hours per year. And then if you use more than, you know, the, the basic, then you paid uh, uh, more per unit what you were using. So high energy users would pay more, but, but everybody would be entitled to a certain amount of, you know, at a lower rate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there have been a lot of call for energy companies to have social tariffs. Um, because a lot of the water companies do. So if you're on a low income, you can apply to your water company to get your water bills capped. And they're sort of talking about, well, surely there should be a social tariff, which gives generally lower prices for people on a lower income. But at the moment, we everybody just has the same. But you're absolutely right. Something like that would, would really help. Okay. I just have another quick question from the phone. Um, yes, yes, sorry, yeah. just a ba really basic question. Um, I don't know, but is there a standing um, charge for gas as well? Yeah, and absolutely. Is it significant? Like, is it is it is it is it like? Am I am I being too fixated on trying to you know save gas and things? How much how much in general for gas and electricity does it? I mean, obviously it depends on how how big your place is and how much you use. But is it is it is it worth trying to fiddle every tiny tiny drop of you know money saving out? Of yeah, so the, the gas, there is a standing charge on gas as well. So the gas standing charge over a year is typically about £90 on average, um, whereas the electric one's probably £150, £160 a year. So, yeah, um, more of your bill will go on your usage than the standing charge, but the standing charge is still sort of fairly significant when you think you're not getting anything for that. OK, so um, so moving on then to the next sort of headline was which says uh, more than 800,000 UK households install a smart meter since the start of the energy crisis. So there have been a lot of people wanting now to get a smart meter. Um, so this slide, it just gives you a picture of a, not all smart meters look like this, but this is just one type. Um, so the smart meter is your meter itself. Um, so if you wanted to apply, get asked for a smart meter, they'll come and take out your existing electric meter and your existing gas meter if you've got gas and they'll fit a new smart meter. So it's the meter itself that will then send, if it works properly, send your meter readings automatically to your energy company and they will bill you <laughs> according to what you actually use. Alongside the actual smart meter, you then get um, like a, an in-house display which is like a little monitor that shows you exactly how much you're using, how much you might have used today, um, how much you're using at that point in time, um, how much it's costing you. And that can be quite useful if you wanted to explore, you know, 
how much things do cost or under, try and understand why bills are high. Um, you don't have to use that. You can unplug it and put it in a drawer and never look at it. Um, it, it doesn't matter, um, but you would still have the benefit of the actual smart meter that makes sure your bills are up to date. Um, so if you did want to get a smart meter, you just need to ask your energy company. There were issues in the early days where they weren't always compatible if you switched company um, and it would still work, but it wouldn't send the meter readings over. Now, if you asked for one, you should get like a second generation smart meter um, and those would work across all the different companies. So smart meters are, I think, are a good idea. They've been done quite badly, um, but I do think they have quite a lot of benefits um, if they work as they should do. Okay, can, we, can we just add that if anyone does ask for a smart meter, what they also need to be asking for is an accessible in-home display, because they're, they're a display that have been produced through the INIB in conjunction with the, the various energy companies, and that provides spoken information about what the consumption is, how much is being used either in, in kilowatt hours or in, in monetary value, and you can sort of look back over the day or the week as well. So if you do look at getting a smart a smart meter, ask them also for an accessible in-home display, and ask for that to be delivered to you before the smart meter installed takes place so it can be set up it's uh i'd love to say it was a process that's worked well but for so many of our members it's been a, a very challenging process to say the least but i won't, won't, won't bother bog the call down with the, with that at this point but do ask for an accessible and home display lovely thanks for that yeah i should have mentioned that but um yeah absolutely any other questions or comments on smart meters um, can I just add just quickly on, on that, um, we're talking about devices, you know, with, I mean, without any sight, I'm always looking for, like, a smart meter would have to be something which, for me, I would have to, like, access, like, through my phone or, you know, some kind of voice feature. So, like I do with my mobile, I can check how much data I've used on my mobile phone. So, it would have to talk to me. And it's the same with, I've got a little box by the boiler which it controls like, you know, the hours where the boiler comes on and off. And that's like, it doesn't talk to you. So there's no way I can, I don't know if they make boxes like that. Um, you know, boiler control boxes and I'm, I'm kind of new to visual impairment. So I don't know how much of this stuff is available from RNIB or places where these boxes can talk to you. Uh, can, we, can we help out there? Yeah. So what we were just mentioning there, and it's Mark from uh, Outlookers, uh, what we were mentioning there in terms of the accessible in-home display does exactly that. It, it, it tells you uh, what your what your usage is. So you can press the button on the top, it'll say using X pence per hour of gas and X pence per hour of electricity. And then there are other buttons that you can press that take you through and give you give you more detail uh, on, on how it all what and what your usage is so all of that is through it's, it's been developed by the rnib and the energy companies so rather than getting the standard display when people have a smart meter installed you get this one that's fully accessible and gives you all the spoken oh, feedback thanks, thanks, thanks. yeah so they're, they're, they're really, which, which organization are you from because what uh, me yeah reason that reason i say uh, is we, we, we did a little we did, we did a little uh demonstration of one that's available online so you can hear what they sound like and the sort of information that you give so if you want to Zuzi's or, or Tim's or, or Vicky's people I can just send them the uh, link to the demonstration and they can if you, you can, yeah. uh, do access anything like that I can send it on to you Pierre, Pierre is Vicky's um, Mark all right fine I'll Vicky I'll send you that link I mean you could send it to all of us please also, uh, Pierre, if, if you're doing things like setting your boiler, um, Hobalt do have an accessible timer system which, which gives you speech for setting the boiler. And also there's British Gas Hive, which lets you set your boiler on your smartphone and you can set your, your schedules and you know change your thermostat settings and that kind of stuff. So there is there is technology out there which does which does make setting your boiler and uh, accessible. 
Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'll have a look into that, definitely. I'll, maybe I'll call RNIB as well. Just I'll, um, I'm... You can set it up the Hive through Alexa as well. You can Hive, yes. You can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Erica okay. knows all about it, Pierre. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put it. Okay, so so yeah, so that's just a bit about smart meters with lots of really useful information for everybody passed on by other people. So that's brilliant. Um, so so the next uh, headline um, says that energy supply accounts cost of devices on standby. Um, so a, a few months ago, British Gas had done this research to say that the average household wastes about one hundred and fifty pounds a year by leaving appliances on standby. Um, I personally think that sounds like a huge amount of money, and I don't really know what all these appliances are that are leaving on, on standby. So um, I did do a little test with like a plug-in electric monitor. So you plug it into the wall and then you plug your appliance in. So I did test some of the things that we had in our house that we may or may not leave on standby. So um, this table just gives you an idea of how much different things cost. So for example, if you've got like a BT box or equivalent, if you left that on standby for a year, every day for a year, it would cost you nearly 16 pounds a year. If you've got like a landline phone, which has little lights and things on, that would cost you probably about five pounds a year, if, which you know, you kind of have to leave some of these things on. Um, things like a clock on your microwave or a clock on a digital radio typically costs up to about £2.50 a year. And I did a little test on like a laptop cable. So if it's plugged in without the laptop actually attached to it, it uses a tiny bit of power, but not very much, probably only about 25p for the year so still using something and it's still not good to leave chargers plugged in if nothing's attached but i reckon it would probably get up to about 50 pounds a year standby things if you added up everything in your house that's on standby so i don't know where they got the 150 pounds from because that sounds quite a lot um but certainly you know I know sometimes you have to pick your battles and some people in your house might think, you know, I'm not going around turning everything off, including my box from a TV because it has to update overnight and this sort of thing. But if you were looking at ways to save everything you can, then not leaving things on standby is, is a good idea. Um, the other thing that um, I've got up on the screen is just a table that I can circulate afterwards, but it gives you an idea of how much power different electrical items use. So it starts in the top with um, an electric shower. So an electric shower uses more power than anything else that you could have in your house. It would probably use up to, if you had it on for an hour, which you won't, but if you used it for an hour, um, it could use up to 10,000 watts or 10 kilowatts. And that could cost you up to about two pound 60 an hour for your electric shower. Everything else up the top is anything like with a heating element. So things like a kettle or an immersion heater. If you heat your water um, through electric, it's got a tumble dryer, electric heaters, ovens, all those things use a lot of electric. But I think the thing to think about is not just how much electric they use, it's how long they're on for. So a kettle uses a lot but it's not on for very long, is it? It's only on for a couple of minutes. Whereas if you use something like a tumble dryer or an electric heater um, or an immersion heater, if it, you turn that on for an hour, it's gonna be on for the whole hour. So I, I'd suggest that if you want to look at ways to reduce your electric bill, focus on the things that use the most electric and that's on for significant lengths of time. So if you use a tumble dryer, I mean, that's a big culprit. It sounds obvious, wash, dry your clothes outside as much as possible. Um, if you run your washing machine, which obviously we all have to do, see what temperature you set it on. Um, perhaps make sure it's always full so you can knock down how many times you use it, say by once a week. So I think with energy, we're never going to say, right, don't do this, don't do that. It's just go around and think about everything that you do use. And is there anything you can do in terms of how you use it? to reduce how much energy it's using. So if you do have an immersion heater, it doesn't really need to be on all the time. 
just perhaps turn it on for a couple of hours a day, that will probably be sufficient. Down at the bottom of the table, right at the very bottom, is we've got your phone charger. And you could charge your mobile phone for an hour and it would cost you less than 0.2 of a P. So nothing, nothing really at all. Your broadband router, about 0.2 of a P an hour as well. Um, things like a TV, that, you, that would probably cost you, depending on how big your TV is, up to about 5p an hour. Um, so it's it, as I say, there's quite a big difference between things like TVs and chargers compared to those big hungry users of you know things with the heating elements. Um, and the chap who's doing his ironing, if you're still doing it, um, that will probably cost you about 45p an hour to do your ironing. Um, so yeah, I always think ironing is something you can just use as an energy saving tip and not do it. But um, yeah, <laughs> you're obviously doing that today. So that's just to give you an idea of, you know, some of the, so how much some, some things cost to run. So um, are we finishing at 11? Shall I crack through the last few things? Just uh, yeah. um, um, So the last couple of things I just wanted to mention is, uh, first one is energy performance certificates. So if you've moved into your house in the last 15 years, you should have an energy performance certificate. And this will give an energy rating to your house um, from A down to G. So these are a legal requirement when you sell a house or rent it out. So you, you can access these online. You can search by your address um, and you can find out how energy efficient your own house is. And it will give you an idea as well what you could do to improve it, whether you need insulation, replace your boiler, replace your lighting, that sort of thing. And it will give you an idea of how much your energy bills are likely to be. These are also particularly useful if you're moving home. Um, I'm not sure anyone particularly looks at them, but always have a look at this for the house you're thinking about buying, because it will give you an idea of how much your bills might be. And if you are in a house that needs insulation doing, um, I'd always check with your local council to see what grants they have. Um, a lot of them have these home upgrade grants and they aren't necessarily based on being in receipt of benefits. A lot of them are based on household income. So just always check whether there's any grant available um, for things like that. And then finally, um, I just wanted to mention something called the Priority Services Register. So um, this is just a headline from December last year that says Storm Arwen, over 9,000 UK homes still without power after eight days. So I'm sure some of you might have been impacted by some of the storms at the back end of last year and early this year. And for some households, if you lose your power um, or if you lose your gas, if you've got gas, it uh, makes things really, really difficult. So it's really important that you get yourself onto the priority services register with your energy company or with Northern Power Grid who get do all the electric infrastructure or with Northern Gas Networks who deal with all the, um, well, so for some of you, it might be Electricity Northwest actually in Cumbria, but for people in Yorkshire or the Northeast, it will be Northern Power Grid. So they don't know who people are who would be vulnerable if they lost their power unless you get yourself on. So the slide I've got up finally just lets people know who qualifies for this. So anybody who's of state pension age can get onto the priority register. Anybody who has a disability or chronic illness, so a hearing or visual impairment is a standalone qualifying criteria. Um, it might be households with children under five, it might be if you've got any medical equipment that has to be plugged in, or if you have a stair lift or anything like that, medicine that has to be kept in the fridge. So you will be eligible for this. Either ring your energy company and they can put you onto it, or there are some online forms um, which I can circulate if you want to email those around to people. Um, alternatively, you're very welcome to give me a call and I can sign anyone up over the phone um, onto this. So it's just for sort of well-being, really. Um, and if you are going to be without power for several days, the companies will look after you and check you're OK and see if you need anything. So 
I think I'll probably stop there because I appreciate we're nearly at 11 and I've gone on for a while. Um, I'll just see if anyone's got any last questions on that. Thank you, Kate. Can you do that? Thank you. Are there any final questions? I mean, time is excellent. Well done, Kate. Yeah. Oh, I've been going on for ages. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, the, the, one, the one last thing, actually, which I will just mention really quickly, if it's okay, is make sure that you're making the savings you can make on your water bills as well. So, if you haven't got a water meter and there's more people in your house, no, there's more bedrooms in your house than people living there, you probably will find it cheaper to have a water meter fitted. So you just pay for the water you use rather than based on the, um, the value of your property. So that can be a really easy way of saving on your water bills. Um, so I'd definitely just check that one out as well. Sorry, that was it. Good, no. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was excellent. I mean, we've, you know, I don't think we've had, we've had so many questions given back to the presenter. So that was excellent. So thank you, Kate. Uh, are, are there any, any more quick ones before we go? Thank you so much for your time, Kate, this morning. Well, thank you for inviting me. And Live Well and Future Vision. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. The Live Well events take place on the second Thursday of each month at 10am. Future Vision sessions take place on the fourth Thursday of each month at 10am and are technology events aimed at people living with sight loss. To attend the next session or to suggest future topics, please contact your local site society who will be able to provide you with the Zoom link.